All right, John chapter number two. John chapter number two. The second half of the chapter. The first chapter, first part of it, uh, was uh, the uh, marriage at Cana. And this is the second part beginning in verse 12. Actually, verse 12 is a transition verse. And then verse 13 to the end of the chapter is the Lord cleansing the temple. Uh, it's interesting that there is a lot of controversy among preachers or among scholars. Uh, you can take that and a quarter and probably put it toward a cup of coffee. Uh, was there one purifying of the temple or two? I'm going to let you educated folks work that one out. <coughs> um, I have my opinion about that and it'll probably stay my opinion because that plus a dollar fifty will get you a cup of coffee at Jake and Dorothy's. By the way, that's what it costs to get a cup of coffee at Jake and Dorothy, so that's what that's what I think of my own opinion on that. But uh, it really is. See, chapter one, two, and three have the same subject: the failure of Judaism. And we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But first of all, I want to just read the entire text. For sake of continuity, uh, beginning in verse number 12. Verse 1 through 11, of course, is the turning of water to wine. Verse 12 is a transition verse. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. You know, you sometimes have to wonder, what is the point here? And in many, many other places in the Bible, what is the point of a uh, historical, secular statement? I mean, he went there and these people went with him. But the truth is, there is some really deep significance in the secular statement. There, there is no such thing as even one verse in the Bible that's just there to kind of fill in the space. There's no such thing. Uh, every verse in the Bible has a deep spiritual significance. And, and what you want to remember, and I will periodically as we go through John remind you, um, the Bible is, is the spiritual food of the believer. Now then, verse, and we'll explain verse 12 in a little bit. So let me read now the cleansing of the temple. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. I, I will need to stop there and make this explanation so I don't have to do it later when I apply. People came from far. They walked long distances from all over that part of the world uh, to be uh, at the Passover, uh, very inconvenient to haul, drag, or lead animals. Everybody had to bring the sacrificial lamb or the dove or uh, the birds, or and that, that would be a whole nother uh, study. And so uh, arrangements were made there for them. They just brought the money. And arrangements were made for them to buy the animal there. Problem is the merchandisers got a hold of that and saw a way to make money. And as this practice evolved over time, it was actually the merchandising which was actually moved into the temple proper area and instead of fair market value the merchandisers and the exchanges of money were charging exorbitant prices 
And what brought that about is people who had to come so far, and it started as a good idea, but it ended corrupt, just like, kind of like things are going in our own nation today. So, they found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a small, a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. I, when we get into this a little more, I, I don't know how far I'll take that statement, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Uh, there obviously are many, many opinions on that. We have folks today who don't even believe in eating a meal in the church. And then at the other extreme, uh, you have the mega churches that have restaurants and Starbucks in their facilities. I'm jesting when I say I might tolerate the Starbucks. Just kidding. No, I wouldn't. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of that house hath eaten me up. That would be Psalm 69.9. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou to us, seeing thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Being an adult audience, I think you all understand what he meant. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? And, and by the way, the temple wasn't even finished, and it, it was forty-six years in the building process, at the time that this was written, and it really still wasn't quite finished, but of course he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said unto them. <coughs> now we all know that it took the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, for the disciples to really get locked in and come down with uh, whatever it took for them to minister. Amen. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Uh, there, Belief in him was a, as a prophet, as a healer, as a miracle worker, but not as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And, and that crowd is probably alive and well in the world today. So the story of the cleansing of the temple. Uh, let me tie chapter 1, 2, and 3 together. Uh, in chapter 1, you have the, uh, and, and the story of, of those three chapters is the unbelief of Israel. In chapter 1, the fact of this is brought forth, verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Then in chapter 2, you have that fact illustrated uh, in the first half, uh, they have no wine. The joy had gone out of their faith, out of their religion. It was just dead orthodoxy. And, and today in the story of the desecrated temple and the problem, and we'll get into this in a little bit, the problem in the temple was idolatry. Uh, they did not realize that, they, they, but we, we'll get into all that. And then, of course, in chapter 3, the chapter best known to most people is the conversion of Nicodemus, one of their chief leaders who was not even saved. Uh, the key verse, uh, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I said unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, what we have here 
is uh, a religious system that had long departed from the Lord and from the Word of the Lord. Secondly, let me just give you a very quick but interesting contrast between the marriage in the story and the temple story. Uh, the marriage was a festive gathering. The temple gathering was the scene of judgment. The marriage, the Lord was invited. The temple, he came on his own initiative. The marriage, the Lord used a human instrumentality to get the job done. The temple, he acted alone. Uh, the marriage, he supplied something, wine. The temple, he emptied something, uh, the money changers. Uh, yeah, the marriage, the Lord was commended. The temple, his ministry was challenged. I think that's an interesting observation in today's world that uh, outside of the religious area, he was commended. Inside, he was challenged. Amen. That's an interesting observation. Uh, the, marri uh, the marriage incident, the wine, obviously his blood points to death. Uh, the temple, the third day, points to his resurrection. Uh, the marriage incident manifested forth his glory. The temple incident manifested forth his zeal. Two different stories with two completely different lessons and two completely different outcomes. Thirdly, let's take a look at uh, Capernaum. Capernaum means blessing and judgment. That's the meaning of Capernaum because of what is happening there. So uh, the little interim there between the two stories. Verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days, actually um, only two days. Uh, Matthew 11.23 makes an interesting observation about Capernaum. Matthew 11.23. Because the Lord's ministry was rejected there. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ personally <laughs> visited that city. What should have happened when the Lord personally visited that city? What should have happened there? But you shall be brought down to hell because they rejected the ministry of the Lord. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. So, you, you get the connection there. <laughs> Capernaum, divine favor, divine judgment, is what that means. It's a picture of Israel. For, 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 for a short time, the Lord honored Israel with his personal presence. The mother was a representative character of Israel. Uh, the, the brethren were the nation as a whole, and his disciples all of them together. Capernaum was the little group that ended up actually believing. And you really do have the same contingent even in the Lord's work today. Notice he went down, and that was the condition of Israel. No, she continued not many days. Uh, not long did Israel stay in God's favor because they rejected him. Again, I want to read you something that puts light on verse 12 out of Matthew number 23. Matthew number 23, verse 37 to 39. Here's what the Lord finally had to say about the whole scenario of his ministry to the Jews, to Capernaum, to all those cities, to all those places, to Jerusalem, uh, the matter of the temple, the, the whole religious Judaism system is summed up in Matthew 22, 37. The Lord said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest men 
which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Uh, we, we, there, there seems to be an element in Christendom today that is real hung, hung up on election. Well, election is God's side. Uh, the understanding of that are in the deep counsels of God because for 2,000 years now, supposedly the best theological minds have discussed it and yet come to a conclusion. But here is our side, the responsibility side, the human side. The side where we live, planet Earth today, the Lord comes through preachers and teachers and through the Word of God and witnesses. Some respond, but the vast majority, you would not. You would not. And so there are consequences of rejecting the Lord. Your house is left unto you desolate. Having um, spent 25 years with the BMA and uh, under their guidance going to churches that would have died and getting some things turned around and most of them are still church, good churches today. Um, I personally do believe from the Bible and from experience it's possible uh, for even a church corporately to so behave that the Lord will leave. And uh, that doesn't, sometimes those churches die, but the truth is, vast majority of the times those churches don't die. They just go on. But it's obvious to any spiritual mind that there's no spiritual life left there. God forbid that we just ever become a physical ministry where we have a nice building and people come and we go through all that we go through. <coughs> to me, because of what I did for 25 years, I have the most horrid fear of that ever happening in any church. And the solution is when the Lord comes, in whatever way He comes, we must receive Him. <clears throat> because without the Lord, we are nothing. Without the Spirit of God in the ministry, we are nothing. Your house is left unto you desolate. And of course, that's what happened. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that doesn't happen to the end of the tribulation period. There is one verse, I've already used it, but because of verse 12, I need to I go over this verse again. Uh, Hosea 6.2, after two days will he, he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in the sight. This is a prophetic verse delineating the 2,000 give or take years of Gentile ministry at the end of which, the third day, which is Resurrection Day, it also plays into the Lord's time frame of with Him uh, a thousand years is like a day and vice versa. And that's one of the many studies in the Bible that leads most servants of the Lord to believe that we are nearing the end of the times of the Gentiles and the timetable for the Gentiles will end, of course, at the rapture of the church and the tribulation events, etc. Uh, and, and then that third day, when Israel will live again in his sight, makes reference to the Lord returning to the Jews and millennial reign, when the Lord will reign. So, there's a lot there. So, finally, this brings us to the story of a defiled temple. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Notice 
No longer the Passover of the Lord, like in the last chapter, it was no longer the Feast of the Lord. It was the Feast of the Jews, and now it's the uh, Passover of the Jews. We have to be careful. It seems like the longer, and I'm talking maybe about human denominations, the longer they live, the more they replace, thus say the Lord with, no, this is how we're going to do it. It's human nature. And they did it right. Look at the great institutions in America that were all started as Christian institutions. Most of the hospitals were started as Christian hospitals. Most of the major ministries to widows and orphanages were started by uh, believers. And look what monstrosities some of these have uh, grown into. Verse 14, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money. I've already explained it to you. The purpose of this incident is to show the positive evil of Judaism. The temple profaned. It's hard for Gentiles to comprehend what the temple meant to a Jew. It was the hallmark. It was the gold standard. It was the heart of their religious worship. They prided themselves uh, in that temple above all else. Now it was time for the Passover. And what was the main thing about the Passover? All leaven had to be removed. And what does leaven stand for? Sin. So the temple, the heart of Israel's worship, where monogamy, one God, the true God, was what the Jews prided themselves in and what it should have stood for. And when Christ came, to their beloved temple, what did he find? Covetousness and a den of thieves. Covetousness and a den of thieves. Well, is that serious? Oh boy, is that serious. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Remember, the best interpretation of Scripture is always Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter Number five, and I am going to read verse six through ten. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? This is a very hard concept. This is a very hard biblical principle for us to understand. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. Purge out there from the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to comfort you with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you need have gone out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother, or a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a raider, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such one no, not to eat. Skip to the end of verse 13. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. What does the Bible say in verse 10? Covetousness is idolatry. The Jewish temple, the religious crowd, their religious system, the very thing that they prided themselves on the most was the very thing that they were allowing covetousness, which is 
idolatry. Now, let me make just a real practical observation there. I've seen churches uh, grow rich. I've pastored some very poor churches where we never knew from one day to the next how we were going to pay the bills. And then I've seen churches that, I've been in churches where lots of money was put away. And if you're not careful, that becomes an idol. Let's be careful never to let the checkbook or the bank account become an idol. You have to be careful about that. It's very important. There's this fine balance. If the church owns property, then you've got to have some money on hand if something breaks. An air conditioner goes out. That's now $7,000 for give or take. Uh, so if the church has money, I mean, if the church owns property, you've got to have some money to take care of things. But the other extreme is you get to the accumulating so much uh, that um, uh, people get to fighting over what we're going to spend, or more particularly, people get to fighting over what we're not going to spend. When it gets to that problem, that's, then that, that becomes problematic, then that becomes covetousness, and the Lord will remove his blessings from the church that takes that mindset. So we have to be careful there. Covetousness, which is idolatry. So um, I'm going to give you some practical lessons in, in the closing moments. But let me just remind you, chapter 1, 2, and 3 is all to prove the emptiness of their religious worship. Chapter 1 a blinded priesthood, chapter 2, a joyless religious nation and system, and chapter, uh, at the end of chapter 2, a desecrated temple. A lot of practical lessons for any church to observe and be very careful about. So, uh, just some practical lessons for, for us to learn out of this story. Number one, I want you to see the zeal of the Lord for his house. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 15. When he had made a small, a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. Made a small scourge and drove them all out of the temple. Look at verse 16. Uh, Take these things hence and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. <coughs> Uh, verse number 17, his disciples remembered it was written, the zeal of that house hath eaten me up. Let me show you a couple other verses. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. We're talking about the Lord's zeal. Ephesians 5. <clears throat> 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. How much? He gave himself for it. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Verse number 15. Paul instructing Timothy. But if I tarry long, that thou mightest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth, the Lord's zeal for the church. I was uh, blessed as a young man in the ministry to have a teaching pastor uh, that taught me that the leader of the church, first of all, had better love the Lord, had better love his people, had better love the church. And if anybody, and no church is ever going to do well if the pastor doesn't literally eat, sleep, and breathe in his love for the church. 
Because if that level of dedication, commitment, and love is not emanated from the pulpit that way, the church is in trouble. I do not understand. I'm glad I don't. It's all I can say. Grace over in my own life. I've got way too much that one day I'm going to have to stand before the Lord and say I'm sorry for it. And so I, I, I don't spend much time wondering about others. But I, I do. I've never quite understood uh, churches and pastors that they show up for two hours on Sunday and then you don't see them again next Sunday. I, I just, and of course their churches show it. The Lord loved the church. How much? He died for it. And I'll tell you what, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I'll fight for you guys. You've only seen me mad one time. <laughs> And that, was, that wasn't a temper fit. That was righteous indignation because somebody was going to mess with you all. And I admitted I crushed his head. But nobody messes with my sheep. The Lord's zeal. Number two, the Lord's holiness. Verse number 15. Let's go back to John. John 2. Verse number 15, when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. Revelation 16 talks about the wrath of the Lamb. And that is just kind of an unheard subject. This is not a temper fit. This was not a temper fit. This was inflamed holiness because the holiness of his father's house had been desecrated the wrath of the Lamb. Holy, God's holiness and righteousness. And then, of course, and Brother Joel brought this out in last Sunday morning sermon, uh, the other half of, uh, of um, um, making up my house, a house of merchandise, is uh, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but he have made it a house of merchandise. Do I think that our churches have drifted too far to the right in worldliness? Yes, I do. Personal opinion. I do. Do I think we're using or have as a nationwide church organization type thing, uh, Christianity, do I think we've moved too close to the world? Yes, I do. Not close enough to be condemned, but close enough to get away with it. And the weapons of our warfare are not worldly. They're spiritual. I've told you before, man, the, call, the phone calls, my goodness, the commercial calls that we get here at the church. And, and it doesn't matter what it is. It, the, the spiel is always the same. You've got to have this, or, you can't, or your ministry is not complete. And it's all I can do to stay nice. What I really want to do is say, and hang up on it. I know it. You know, I'm a pastor. I can't do that. But I want to do that so bad. Maybe my last day here, my last sales call, I'm going to go and hang up on it. Thank God for a nice building and thank God for our amenities. But folks, let's never forget the church is a spiritual thing. Amen. Amen. It's a spiritual thing. Now, of course, number four, uh, proof of uh, deity. Uh, beginning in verse number 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing thou doest do these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty-six years was the building in this temple, and you're going to rear it up in three days, but he spake of the temple of his body. He went there, for he was risen from the dead. His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus said. Proof of 
resurrection. And one more thing, I gotta quit. Last three verses. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles, which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Uh, 1 Kings 8 39, for thou only, Lord, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Only God knows which response is the correct one. There is obviously the response of unbelief and rejection, and there is the response of professors, head knowledge, but then there is the response of believers who humble themselves before the Lord and receive Him and know that they're born again and begin a productive Christian journey. Next week, Lord willing, uh, we will be in chapter number three, which of course is a story we all know well, um, a story of the conversion of Nicodemus. I have I've always told people about chapter number three. If you have the opportunity to witness and you don't know what to do, walk them through John 3, the first 16 verses. Walk them through John 3, the first 16 verses. A 10-year-old child.